Well, they should be thinking about what is the role, what is their appropriate role in stimulating innovation in this space? Uh, leading, leading with vision and uh, leading with dollars where, where necessary. Um, you, know, you look at uh, turnpikes, for example, which uh, the, the term comes from private roads where they would actually turn the pike and they would raise it for you and you would go from one road to the next. Well, that was a hugely inefficient system for, for transportation. And so the federal government decided to buy those roads back and there was a lot of legal issues involved. You know, how do you make sure you, you're getting the, giving these individuals the right amount of money? You know, you, you, it's a difficult thing. There's some eminent domain involved, so there's got to be due process and fair market value. But by realizing how much they could accelerate society by having this kind of free bandwidth available right, in our nation's you know, uh, highway infrastructure, it really improved the quality of the planet. Well. You know, to your question of how do you network the, network the country better, well, where's the free bandwidth? You know, we, we know we have technologies, fiber optic technologies, which are so massively high bandwidth. Why, don't, why, doesn't, why isn't it everybody's right to be able to get fiber optic to their home? Now, you've got you've to deal with lots of issues there. You know, if, it's, if, you're, if you're doing that in an apartment building, well, you know, how do you, who pays for getting that? last mile but that's something the government should be leading on because we all should have the right to that kind of, of bandwidth we you know we did it with highways we've done it with many things before where now it's true that there's a tremendous value in having a bunch of uh, free market competitors trying to come up with better solutions but at the same time there's proven technologies that solve so many of these problems that could be um, guarantees could be made by the government that this level of bandwidth is going to be available and we're going to put this kind of money up and we're going to make sure the right of way exists uh, and then those problems could be solved by whatever uh, technology whatever company uh, comes to the fore but um, I think that's one example uh, that, that comes to my mind of how governments can they can, they, can, they can realize the benefit of us all being networked like that. And they can lead with a vision and lead with dollars to make sure it happens now rather than you know, 20, 30 years from now. My most fervent wish is that it empowers me to be more of a natural biological human being than my parents were, and also greatly empowers my digital extensions of myself. So I want a both and future rather than either or. You know, either I get um, smarter or my machines get smarter. But um, if I you know, learn how to use a calculator and I forget how to do long division, that's OK, as long as those calculators are ubiquitous. As long as, I, as long as those calculators are as organic as everything else in my environment, I can count on them. They're persistent. Um, I don't want a, a future where I am less socially aware, globally aware, um, a feeling of uh, feeling individuated, um, self-empowered, um, feeling like I'm able to contribute meaningfully to my community. Technologies, I have this law of technology, my third law of technology, is that the first generation technologies are usually dehumanizing. Second generation technologies are indifferent to humanity. So there's some positives and some negatives, but in general, they're, they're a wash. And then with luck, third generation technologies are net humanizing. And that seems to be something you can observe from you know cities to cell phones to uh, any technology that you think that you know is important that impacts human beings. Generally, the interface designers and the, and the systems folks, they don't get it right the first time. And maybe they, they can't get it right. They just have to, they have to realize what we use and what we don't and, and what are the downsides of the way we use our technologies. So my fervent wish is that we get past the first generation effect. We compress that first and second generation as fast as possible as we move into the, this metaverse space of incredibly intelligent technologies. And then my secondary wish is that 
the, the, my digital twin. You know, when I, I, I fully expect that I'm going to have an avatar that in my senior moment, you know, sometime after 2016, is going to be whispering in my ear the word that I wanted to say. Because that's how repetitive I am. That's how easy it is. If, if I'm running a life log and everything that I'm seeing is being dumped text, and I have some simple augmented reality or augmented intelligence system like, like an avatar that I use to, uh, as an interface to the world, well, that avatar is going to understand a lot of simple things about me. It's going to be able to handle a lot of my simple uh, scheduling tasks. It's going to um, be my first generation filter, my first pass filter on meeting strangers that I don't know. It's going to allow me to be a lot more the kind of person I want to be rather than keeping track of lots of little things that I don't want to be, don't want to do. But I think that can also be misused. Um, my digital extensions are going to vastly exceed my own rate of learning, I think. But I think there is a first generation uh, risk in those cases that, that they dehumanize me at the beginning. You know, first generation video games our, our socialization skills go down, we become more isolated. Um, we don't use them as enhancers of our navigation of the physical world. And we don't, um, we don't um, see them as things that are extensions of us, but they are. If I spend 24 hours you know, um, a week in World of Warcraft, that's me. I'm, that's part of me. So I need to be able to have as much control over that, over the quality of the time that I'm spending, over, um, over um, the data that's there, um, the, um, and privacy, and uh, trust, and reputation, all the things that I have in the physical space. I need to have all of those things in the virtual space as well, or it's going to dehumanize me to spend that kind of time in there. And if it's big entertainment companies that are running the early versions of these spaces, then uh, it's stickiness of eyeballs that are going to be the, uh, what's driving the mechanics of that, rather than personal empowerment. So for me, I have a very positive long-term vision, but I can see lots of problems on the way there. And I think if we, if we pay attention to what these things do to us and what we want them to do to us, we can have a world where, you know, um, cars are driving me, uh, my car is driving me everywhere 90% of the time in 2050, but when I'm not using the car in the automatic driving mode, I'm actually a better driver than my parents were. I'm not significantly better, but I'm a little better than they were. I'm a vastly better driver than, than they, am, they are in general because I've got this digital driver doing most of my driving. But I've also got an educational component to it. So that system like the lane departure warnings on the new Lexus, right, that gives you the little ding, you know, those kind of systems actually make you a better driver than your parents were. If we mandate that, if we say, you know, we're not going to let our technologies take away the basic things that we consider important. So we want to make sure our, our kids have better civics. I mean, our kids today have, poor, have worse civics than, than uh, our parents and our grandparents. They don't really understand what it means to be a citizen or, or um, kind of the context of a lot of the decisions that are made on national or, or global levels. Um, they understand other things that our parents you know, would find um, mind-blowing. But they have actually fallen backwards in certain areas. And so I think if we pay attention to that, to the direction that we want people to be able to go, uh, we can have these kind of both and futures, neither, not, not the either or future that, uh, that often seems to happen in the first, first pass. I would say it's the conversational user interface. Um, I think the metaverse is important. Um, the ability for us to have a mirror world in virtual space that is more rich and interesting uh, and productive than the physical space that you and I inhabit. So that you and I will actually feel like we're, we're in an impoverished space to be, to be sitting here talking unaugmented when, uh, when everything that I'm saying, all, all the web and uh, websites and the metadata that's associated with that could be being uh, projected on the walls around us from our little, you know, micro projector that's you know, 
in our scarf or whatever. Um, that kind of a world is tremendously empowering. It gives us, you know, we're going to be managing virtual people. Uh, you know, n nine tenths of the people that we're talking to on on the web will probably not be um, real people. They'll be virtual digital assistants that'll be doing things for us, and those skills will snap back 100% into real space because all the skills that you and I are so good at, this facial recognition, this one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we'll be able to use those out in real space. We'll be using them in virtual space. So that's a that the metaverse is, has an incredible upside from its ability to be a mirror world plus. So it, it's a true superset of the physical space. It has everything that we have in it in physical space plus all these additions. So that's a wonderfully unifying thing. But I think the central linchpin of that is going to be this conversational interface, the ability to speak naturally. You know, we talk to our computers like this right now. That's why we don't think of them as part of us. They are not really part of us. But we're going to, you know, you and I use this you know, it's 200 bits per second. It's very low bandwidth, but it's very high content. You know, we, we, we can have a, a vocabulary of 100,000 words if we're specialists in some, you know, in, in medicine or law or whatever. I mean, it's amazing how much information and the way we string those words together, the programming that we're doing with the English language is so rich. Being able to speak to your computer and have your computer speak back to you in a natural human, in a natural uh, conversational tone is, I think, going to be the thing that's going to empower our use of all of our technology. And you can actually chart that that's going to happen sometime between 2012 and 2019. Uh, because you and I spoke to Alta Vista, uh, one of the early search engines, an average of 1.3 words in 1998. In 2005, we spoke to Google, 2.6 um, words average query length. Uh, that suggests that we're going to speak to another more complicated search engine, 5.2 words in uh, 2012 and 10.4 words in 2019. You and I speak in natural conversation an average of 11 to 14 words per sentence, depending on our context. So 10.4 words average conversation to your conversational interface, which is going to be the front end to all the, th the metaverse, to your avatars, to you know, your, your robo-kitchen, you know, to everything that's just complex in your life is going to be tremendously empowering for us. And I think that, you know, you think the Internet was big? I think that we're going to, we're going to say that the era before the conversational interface was the Wild West. And we're in the last few years of the Wild West. And everything from that point forward is going to be totally different. Because, you know, kids in 2015 who can learn as fast as their curiosity drives them through a cell phone talking to the web and learning anything that they want. Uh, you know, that generation that grows up around the world with that capacity is going to be a fundamentally different generation than what we, what we have today. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that we will see um, the ability to, um, to speak in a pidgin language we won't think of these computers as artificially intelligent. We won't think of them as smart. But to be able to speak to them and have them speak back to us uh, using the same skills that we do here. And, of course, they'll be pruning that what they say based on everything that we say to them. And teaching my digital twin how to respond better to what I said seems to me like a very natural way to use technology, uh, much more uh, sophisticated than having to upload the latest you know, software to my, uh, I mean, having it all happen on the back end, the way it does with Google, for example, that's, that's the kind of relationship that we want to our technology. Oh, I would say it's Web 2.0. That's probably the closest. Yeah, so the, the, the World Wide Web is, is a collaboration space. It's actually a virtual brain. Right? Google, Google is an oracle, really what it is. Google is, is, is a is an ever smarter virtual brain. You know, like I was saying yesterday, you know, Google didn't know the word near six months ago. But now, if you, if, if you know that you can say to Google, um, coffee shops near San Pedro, and now you've got, you know, you've just spoken a five-word sentence, six-word sentence to, uh, five-word sentence to Google, that has significantly more, um, naturalness than what we were doing previously. You know, putting something in a search box and running down and trying to find that out. And if you put 
if you do meta tagging with uh, Flickr, or if you run a blog, or if you if you uh, are part of a social software network, what you're doing on the web, you're building a collective repository of information that has higher and higher meaning to human beings. And it's going across all languages. You look at Wikipedia today. If you went in and you, and you decided to uh, expand one of the little stubs in Wikipedia because you know something about that that no one else does, or you think, you just look at what they've got and you, you know you could do a little better than what they've got. So you polish the banister a little bit, you know, and you build it out a little further. Well, you've done a tremendous service for a long period of time to a lot of people. So building Web 2.0 and all of the rich media applications and all of the all of the extensions that are coming on top of that is a tremendous service to all of humanity. And I think if we can get that concept across to people and we can get them uh, trying to learn and use those things um, early on, um, make sure their kids are digital, you know, make sure that that uh, they are doing everything that they can to adopt technology, not when it's bleeding edge, but when it's leading edge. As soon as it's gotten to a level where you know, they can they can accept that. Because I think what you do then is you create this significant positive feedback loop. And then all the people, all the visionaries out there know they have a market. Because it's consumers that are the rate limiting step in all of these things. So if we see the vision, if we see how much uh, we're impacting our children's future by what we do today in these collaborative technologies, because all of that information persists if we want it to. Right? Those emails that you know we did in '93, I mean, they're all still out there on Usenet. If we want, you know, people want to Google them, right? I think if we recognize that, then we recognize that we're building something that's much more elaborate than any technological edifice we've ever built before, and far more. Um, important to the to the future of of, of humanity why one word to describe the network future um, don't think I can give you one yeah oh developed yeah I, w I would say that that uh, what we what we are doing, I think, is is a process of development. It's not just evolution, where we're where we're exploring a phase space and we're not sure what we're creating. But development is the other side. That's where convergence comes together, and this and systems are actually following a trajectory that was actually built into the structure of the system. I believe we're developing a future that was waiting for us. It's been patiently waiting for our wits to grow grow sharper, and I would say. We're going to feel more developed psychologically, socially, um, you know, cosmically developed. So that would be my, that would be my word.